shopping. All attendees are in list. Hello. Go ahead. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us this morning for our 19th episode of Business Unusual. I am Brendan Filbert, Managing Partner with SalesWorks, and my job all day, every day, is to help people get in front of their next opportunity, whether that be a fantastic new prospect for their company, or maybe it's their next job and they're trying to secure an engagement. So that's kind of the perspective that I'm bringing to everything. I'm gonna do a really quick intro of our speaker after Chris does his quick intro. So you know who he is. Hi everybody, I'm Chris Motley. Um, I'm the owner of Big Fish of Mar uh, Motley, Motley Creations. It'd be really nice if I knew my last name. We do uh, managed marketing services. So basically um, small and medium sized businesses with big goals and um, we help them find the right size solutions to e execute on their marketing strategy. And we also help them to develop um, the brand and image that they need. Um, and I'm really great, uh, grateful that our uh, guest is here today. Cody is a rock star, great guy. And uh, um, thank you all for showing up. And I'm excited. I'm going to kick things off with a really quick intro because this is kind of a fun session for me. So I don't know what many of you that know my full background, but I started doing sales training back in 2001 actually in the office next door to where Cody is sitting right now. My very first gig that I had is I started as a client with the Sandler Sales Institute and had such phenomenal results, not only through what I learned in terms of just being um, a lot more effective as a salesperson, but the biggest thing that I got out of the whole experience, I couldn't have accomplished it with years of therapy. And most people don't recognize that it's not knowing what to do, it's overcoming all of that head trash and all that stuff that happens between your ears that stops you from executing. So what I'm really excited about today is Cody is not only gonna give you insight into how to be the virtual meeting pro, but he's gonna help you overcome some of that discomfort that you may be experiencing in just this whole transition that we're in the middle of right now because truly it is it is business unusual for the world and he's going to walk us through how we can kind of get a little bit more confident in our day-to-day -day role and in our shoes so i'm excited to turn things over to cody and as i turn things over i'm going to go ahead and kill my webcam so that I don't end up sucking up bandwidth and I'm excited to learn right along with you. So Cody, take it away. Again, thank you guys so much for the awesome, uh, the awesome introductions. I uh, uh, jump in first, first of all, who's this for, right? Kind of first thing we got to talk about, uh, business owners, marketing, business development professionals who are frequently doing online meetings. This is a new, new, not really new anymore, but something that we're having to get used to is being like this as opposed to and in a business that we do training face-to-face -face training in a gigantic training center this has been a transition for us too but um it's kind of where we're at um so i'm excited to kind of take over today i was told what this quote was <laughs> earlier so i'm glad but uh fun 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 to your daddy takes the t-bird away that's what i'm hoping to have today and uh, just kind of a quick um making these more fun and, and kind of the framework we're going to go through um is uh, the easiest way to start is a little bit about just my background uh, neuroscience is my background i love the brain and i love applying it into people's lives practically um, and into business obviously um, that's where i spend a lot of time and uh so the first kind of the framework of the conversation i'm hoping to have will be understanding human beings and what it like just understanding that when you're in these types of zoom meetings having an understanding of how the person that's across from you or across from you in the Zoom conversation or go to meeting, whatever it is, um, how they take in information differently. Um, so understanding like neurologically, what's some of the differences that you have to take into account when you're in a Zoom conversation um, and just period, then moving more into kind of the mind. So there's some really cool things that um, your mind, and we're gonna dive real deep into this, but from a neuroscientist perspective, <laughs> adults are just children wearing adult costumes 
little bit of a chuckle usually, and that it's a it's a fun type trope. But there's some really fun uh, things within transactional analysis, which sounds fancy, and we'll dive deeper into that. And upfront contracts that can really help you frame up your Zoom meeting and kind of direct it in the direction you want to go. Um, when you can understand just how the mind works, and then jumping into some specific Zoom tips, um, how to start them, some different frameworks for conversations, um, some sharing tips, different things like that, based on understanding the neuroscience of what's happening upstairs and the mind that the brain is kind of creating in these conversations first. Um, so bear with me. And then the last piece will be kind of changing some beliefs. There's a lot of head trash, um, which is kind of that mental garbage that you have, that voice in your head that's like, oh, we we're gonna go right back to a meeting in person or or I can't make this cold call or I'm too scared to walk in this networking event. Those beliefs that kind of circle inside your head, um, specifically surrounding Zoom, um, understanding again, what's going on upstairs in your head um, and then how to shift those and change some of those uh, to be more productive and then have better, have better beliefs around moving into these virtual conversations. Um, okay, so real quick before you jump in, perfect. Coach, and get started mm -hmm. on this. Let's do a quick survey of our group. Okay. So now that Cody's gone through this and he's kind of given us the, here's what our topic is gonna to be today. My first question that I have for our group, and I'd like for you to use the questions pane, as Chris referenced earlier, I'd like for you to answer the question for me of how many of you are currently using Zoom meetings or doing virtual meetings right now. So let's take just a quick minute and survey where you all are at, because we want to make sure that we're applying this. Do we have a bunch of pros? I got a few. Okay, so so far we've got some that are and some that aren't. Okay, so first question, then my second question that I have. So first question is, are you there now? My second question is, how often are you having Zoom meetings? Are you more than twice a week? That's gonna be my next question. Okay, I got a few using it. Okay, so I've got some pros on the, we've got some pros here today, Cody. So yeah, yeah. so okay, so we're good. Now, now my third question that I have is when you're giving, when you're participating in the Zoom meetings, is it via a platform like Zoom or Google Hangouts that's one-to-one? -one? or are you delivering via webinars and to a group of people as well so that's my third question that i have we got some answers coming in nice. okay so mostly networking all right but we do have we do have some group meetings that are going on via zoom as far as that platform okay fantastic so Cody, that sets the framework for who you're going to be talking to today. It sounds like we've got some folks that are brand new to this and we want to make sure that we cover information that helps you get just comfortable with the tech. And then also we want to make sure that we give those of you that are more advanced, you're going to have some insight into how to make these, how to make these meetings amazing. All right, Cody, run with Heck yeah, I'm excited. And please feel free to, I've been told I will be poked and prodded if there are questions that I do not see. So feel free to continue to ask them. Um, Brendan and or Chris will probably just pop in and jump in under those. Um, so before we dive into specific Zoom things, again, understanding the primary sensory dominance, like understanding what's going on in the brains of the people that are across from you um, in the Zoom virtual conversations. So one of the interesting things, and we're gonna dive very deep into this, but big picture, people, our brains are a mechanism and an organ that takes in sensory information pretty, that, and determines, we, we take it in, we kind of chew on it a little bit, much more complicated than that, but you chew on it and then you have your perception and whatever that is. And so when you start to think about that in, in a Zoom setting, there's some interesting things, some stats and statistics you can use to understand these different types of people. Um, and so the first one, the very important piece is the visual portion. Um, in a Zoom conversation, it, it's it's kind of fun. Um, you there, we do tons of research. 
I can't help it, empirical neuroscientist here, but when you are looking at some of the stats of a Zoom conversation versus face-to-face -face interaction, as far as attention, um, when you're looking specifically at that, uh, when you're on a Zoom conversation, there is, uh, there was a, they just did a study where they measured the attention of people with the camera on in a Zoom call. Um, the attention in a face-to-face -face conversation, there's about 43% of the time people are distracted. Um, in reality, there's something going on behind you, something's buying coffee, somebody, baby's crying, whatever it is. And so 43-ish percent of the time, they're not focused. In a Zoom conversation with the camera on, there's actually a bias in your head. When you have this little green dot like I have in front of mine uh, that knows that you're being watched and you have that bias somewhat in your head. And so what they measured actually is that only 4% of the time people aren't focused in a Zoom conversation um, on what's on the screen and being paying attention to you. So there's more attention ever on earth that there has been on you. And then the piece that we're gonna dive in here is that this visual show me group um, is 76% 76, 76 of humans are visual learners. And so your ability to show people things and their ability to be focused on those things has never been higher, which is really, really exciting. And so visual is one group, but there are also there are also a couple different groups. So when we look at primary sensory dominance, we are looking primarily at visual, auditory, kinesthetic. And so the those are three groups of senses. Yes, I, I understand there are five, um, in which we'll, we'll dive into a fun one here, but visual, which is sight, so show me, auditory, which is your hearing, right? The hearing sense, tell me more about it. And then kinesthetic, which is the most ambiguous, but that's the feeling one, like the gut feeling, those, the, the touch um, a little bit um, slower and it's the, the the auditory and kinesthetic kind of split right in half the visuals 76 percent of us are visual um, and you can be more than one so these are kind of the big picture of the the huge ways we have enormous pieces of our brain that are focused on these three areas you've got your occipital lobe in the back which is a whole lobe that is determined that's focused just on visual information you got your auditory temporal lobe right here on the side of your head and then right in the top kind of going across like this you've got your kinesthetic uh, parietal lobe um, and so the neurology behind these kind of sensory dominances are important to understand as you're talking with people because some of the ways to read this and we'll get into this um, you can tailor your conversation based on their sensory dominance and so as we dive into some of these specific things Oops, went ahead there. What we're gonna focus on are eye movements, hand movements, rate of speech, and word choice. All of those are things that you can um, over Zoom be able to see. Eye movement is a little bit up in the air, but um, you can typically still see some eyes if their camera's on. Um, rate of speech is a huge one, and then the word choice will be a big one. Hands, again, are a little bit hard on Zoom, but we'll still give you the information. Um, and so as we go through these, Thinking about, okay, are they auditory, visual, or kinesthetic, and how do I shift the way that I'm communicating um, so that I, they can more effectively understand me um, it is kind of the framing to have for this conversation as we dive into what these are. Um, and so when you when we're looking, the first one, like I mentioned, 76% of us are visual. Um, I am a visual person. And um, as we dive in, when you, the the read or whatever you want to call it you can make the first one and the easiest one is the eyes of the people in front of you um, and so for me i've got this giant screen here it's probably pretty easy to see my eyes um, but the the thing to be watching for and the way to kind of get get this to start this wheel turning is asking as you're asking questions and they're piecing together stories and different things like that um, their eyes will move as they go to grab information out of their brain in the back pieces of it reconstruct it and then communicate it to you during that reconstruction their eyes will move if they're visual up into the left so they'll look like this they're like huh or just straight up i'm one of those a lot of the times i'm just like as i'm thinking right and that's a visual person i am trying to um piece together that visual picture that's beautiful in my brain and be able to communicate it out so that's one of the first reads you can make as you've probably already noticed um, visual people also use their hands at time which 
this is a, the probably one of the only groups you'll be able to use in an effective way this knowledge because a visual person even on camera and i can't even help myself from doing it use their hands a ton because there's a picture and I, I can see it i can manipulate it almost that's how a visual person kind of thinks that's how their brain works um and so that's another read is very active hand movers are typically visual people um and then the rate of speech this is one that i get in trouble for a lot in these types of mediums <laughs> i um we visuals talk at the speed of light <laughs> um and that is my ultimate chagrin most of the time um because i just i i am very aware of this because i'm a linguist I'm a, I, this is stuff that i'm aware of a ton but most of the time people aren't aware how fast they're talking um and so a visual person may sound a little bit more like this and you can't understand what they're saying because you could talk this fast if you wanted to but if they understand to slow down so people can understand what you're saying um they'll have that little switch but if they don't know that, they will be talking really, really, really fast because there's a movie in their head and they are trying to articulate it as fast as they're seeing it in their head. And that's why they kind of speak at the speed of light. Um, and, and that's something that you can watch for in this Zoom medium um, still. Um, and then the final one, the word choice, the visual people use visual metaphors, visual words, visual descriptors, all that stuff. So here, some, some examples are, are right here. Uh, do you see what I mean? Is that clear to you? Can I paint you a picture? Um, and how does this look? All of those are visual cues that this person's probably piecing together their communication and their thoughts visually. And so when you want to bond with their brain in a more effective way in your communication, matching some of these specific characteristics is, is the way to go. So if you're a slower speaker, but you're talking to a visual person, being able to pick up the speed a little bit will help them comprehend and hear you more effectively. It'll hit their brain way simpler. Um, when you're looking, the easiest one is looking at word choice. Um, I was, a fun example, I was, when I first started to learn this, I was like, there's no way that this is true. Like I was very skeptical. I was like, okay, this is like kumbaya in the forest. What, there's no way this is true. <laughs> and so I went to a networking event and I seriously, there was this lady, she's talking at the speed of light, her hands are up doing tornadoes. She, she's she got all these cues and she's a visual person. I was like, okay, let's try this out. So help me, what, tell me what your day, what's a day sound like to you? And I very specifically said the word sound like to test this out. And she, we were in the middle of a conversation. She's like, what does it sound like? And she paused and she's like, well, I was like, well, could you paint me a picture of your day? And she's like, Okay, paint you a picture, thousand miles an hour, hands are up, just spitting this movie out. And it was that quick. I was like, no freaking way. Um, and instantly I bonded with her a little bit more effectively. That's the same thing over this vision, this Zoom platform or this meeting type, um, even this digital world, those still are happening. Uh, and so you can still affect those things in their brains. Hey, um, Cody, so that's let's, visual. Do a, let's do a let's do a poll. And oh, ask yeah. how many in our group identify with being visual learners. Ooh, that's a good question. I think this one, it's always fun to get a sense from the audience mm -hmm. of where they think they're at. <laughs> you don't believe I'm visual, go back and listen to to the uh, webinar I gave. You have to like be <laughs> back at half speed to understand a word I say. <laughs> so be <it> is visual. <laughs> Okay, so how many of our group is visual? All right, okay, I've got the me all the way. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yep, I understand that. All right, Trust me. fantastic. Okay, well, now I'm really excited for Cody to share the next one, which is actually my primary sensory dominant. So there tell us all go. about auditory. Yeah, auditory is fun. So uh, the, the difference with auditory people, again, they're more temporal, temporal lobe. Um, but when you're thinking of an auditory person, the, the physiological positioning of their temporal lobe is right on the sides of their ears. You're probably not surprised, but it literally comes down in a little bit like this. And so when they go to take an information, that's important because when they are chewing on that information and trying to piece it back together, their eyes will go left and right because that lobe is right here by their ear. And so their eye is trying to match where that lobe is. 
to grab that information more effectively. And so um, the their eyes go left and right. They're the types that are like, huh, and they're pondering, like they're like, hmm. And they, they look left, their eyes go left or right, either way, e towards either ear. And that's a quick and easy way to remember it. Auditory is about hearing. And so their eyes go towards their ears when they're thinking. And so that's the quick one that you can kind of uh, pick up on as far as eyes. Hands are usually in the middle of the body somewhere more, it's hard to see on a Zoom, but more in the middle or just on their lap. They're not as much of the visual people um, unless there's like a bang, right? And they're like a bell ring or something. Um, but typically they're not using middle of the body or they're not using their hands as much as a visual. Rate of speech is methodical. That's the best way I've capitalized it because it's methodical, um, even tempo, but methodical. Um, they very much care about the way that what they're saying, how it's hitting you and how you're hearing it. Um, and so they, they will slow their rate of speech. They'll talk at an even tempo. They're, it's almost as if they are looking at the commas and periods as literal pieces of communication because it's not a fast stream of consciousness. It's much slower. They emphasize what they want you to hear and it's much slower than a visual is. Um, and it's not my normal. So going back down to that is hard um, and I'm not perfect at it, but that's a little bit of kind of an idea of what it might sound like. And the, the fun one for this, um, well, let's let's do words first. So the, the word choice, before we get to the bonus one, the word choice for them, it, it, you're probably not surprised catching on to the trend here, deals with sound and auditory information. So how does that sound? Does that ring a bell? When, when you're asking those types of questions, it hits their brain much more effectively and they can piece the story together way easier. Um, and when, they, when they're talking, they'll usually say, I don't like the sound of that. Mm, that's not ringing a bell, I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing you. Um, those are some of the things that you can watch for, listen for, and then use yourself. Um, and the fun one, I don't, I don't know if Brandon knew this or, or anything about this, but I had mentioned that there are five senses and we're talking about three, but auditory people, what actually happens is your olfactory is nerves in your nose are what pick up smell and your nose and your ear canal are actually connected. And so there is a group of similar, some similar neuro, neuro like ish in the front of your head uh, that deals with smell and auditory signals. And so auditory people somewhat, sometimes and most of the time have um, some interesting senses of smell. Like my best friend Chris is actually a very much an auditory person, and they he has an incredible like they bring in that information so much easier, and it, it's a piece of of what they talk about. So like Chris and I, like if we walk into our apartment and the trash is we we've got trash we need to take out, we walk in through the door, and Chris is instantly like, "Oh, you smell that?" And I'm like, "No." And I walk around the corner and I see the trash is ready. I'm like, "Oh, dude, that smells terrible." What happened though? I had to walk around the corner and see the trash because I'm visual. Chris walked in and could smell it because he has that, he doesn't need, he's not as visually driven as I am. Um, we'll go on a car ride and we'll have the windows down. We're having a fun time doing our thing. And I'm like, dude, did you see that? Did you see this? And I can't believe we, we drove past this thing. And he's like, dude, I didn't, what? Did you smell that? Did you hear this? Were you, and I'm like, what? I, did you smell the coffee? Did you smell? And I was like, no. And it just completely goes over my head um, and it's nuts. So a sense of smell is not e the easiest one probably on a Zoom conversation, but it is a fun one in, in when you're thinking about some of these things. Sense of smell is a fun one for auditories as well. Um, but otherwise, very much hearing driven when you're thinking about these. That is so cool. Okay, so mm -hmm. pop quiz, how many of our audience is primarily auditory with their sensory dominance? We'll do just a quick poll. So I've already thrown out there that that's me all the way. Judy, Judy's auditory. All right. Hey, Judy, you and me, we're the auditory kids. Awesome. Okay. All right. Now, one thing he mentioned, and I, I want to just come in and correct something just really quick. One of Cody's statements that he made earlier was on kinesthetic, and that's what he's going to dive into next as far as being at a slower rate. One thing that I want you to really um, understand about kinesthetics, he's gonna dive into this in a little bit, 
they tend to be very, very, very smart, highly analytical, intelligent learners. So, but how they learn is is different. He's going to dive into it a little bit, well, quite a bit more. But um, that's one thing that you made that statement early on, and I just wanted to dive in really quickly because kinesthetic, while um, it is a, it, it's the probably the smallest percentage of people. They mm -hmm. are, um, they tend to be your, your analyzers and as far mm -hmm. as how they take in information. So Cody, tell us how we're going to talk to those folks. For sure. So let's, let's, let's get into that then. So, uh, kinesthetics hundred percent, um, are the rate of speech is slow and, and monotone or, or monotone. Um, and so the, the hard part is I look, the easy part is reading their eyes because it's not just their eyes, typically their entire head goes down. Um, and so kinesthetics, when they go in to create that picture in their brain, I'm so visual, I can't even describe it as anything other than a picture. When they create that in their head though, um, they're literally, their eyes go down, either down towards their stomach or most of the time it's like, their eyebrows are furrowed and they're like, right, that's the kinesthetic. They're looking down towards their gut, their feelers, um, they want to they want to understand what it feels like, um, and so they look down towards the floor, towards their gut, whatever helps you. I always think they're looking down towards their gut because they're feelers, um, and hands in pocket, crossed. They're the people like they're sitting back like this. They want to get a feel for the room. They just want to relax and open up, um, and have get the feel like I said for the room. Um, or a lot of the times their hand, their arms are crossed like this, and they may, may appear closed off. Um, and these are all things to be watching for in these Zoom conversations because you can see it. They're sitting like this or they're sitting um, with their a little bit more forward like this. A lot of the times they're the more kinesthetics because they're not needing to use their hand as much. And so they rest them down and they're sitting a little bit more forward like this. Rate of speech, slow and monotone. I'm spelling on that one, my bad. Um, but this one's hard for me to, uh, we're going to try it. <laughs> kinesthetics. Talk much slower, very <laughs> even toned. Their voice is quieter. And if you're a visual, I'm probably driving you crazy um, because you want to finish the sentence. Um, and that's the hard part is like uh, Brennan had actually explained, they are extraordinarily analytical. And when they are down thinking about this and they come up and they present to you in a very like sloth fashion, what's coming at you, um, sloth to you, if you're visual like me, but not to them. But if you interrupt that train of thought, it's they, they have to go back through the whole thing again and really get a feel for what they're about to say before they say it. So it's hard, especially for a visual, um, but not interrupting these people is important, um, especially as you're communicating with them over a medium like Zoom, that's already a little bit probably weird for them because it's hard to feel over Zoom. And so it, they're already a little bit uncomfortable-ish with some of these things plus the lag and some of those things that happen, that's a huge thing to be aware of for kinesthetics. And then word choice, what's your gut say? How do you feel? Or how does that feel to you? Does that resonate with you? Things that get them into their gut are great questions to ask them and be aware that they're probably gonna be, they're gonna be talking about using those types of words, gut, feel, resonate, um, when they're communicating um, with people. Um, and when you're communicating with them, you've got the ability to use those same things. And that's that's the biggest takeaway from these three things, whether they're visual, auditory, kinesthetic, understanding what you are first is very helpful because you can start to watch yourself, pick up your own tendencies that describe whichever you are, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, um, which is helpful. Uh, and then you can also mirror, right? There's all this let's bond and rapport and mirror and match, but what's that mean? It's typically not the sailfish on the wall, right? It's getting and understanding their brain and this is how you do it in a really simple auditory, visual auditory kinesthetic, VAK, and writing that at the top of your VAK, at the top of your notes, and circling whichever read you make is a really, really easy way and a quick tip when you're taking notes to, as you're taking the notes and you see that you've circled auditory, when you come back up, now you're in the frame, I need to slow down, I need to make sure that I'm not going crazy with my hands because it make them uncomfortable, and I'm using auditory cues so that they are comfortable as I'm communicating. Same thing with kinesthetic, same thing with visual. Um, and the kind of last bonus piece is if you're kind of feeling like, well, I'm a kind of this one and kind of that one, 
completely normal. There's typically one primary. So for me personally, I'm visual, but I'm also kinesthetic. Um, and I'm almost 50, 50 on those, except for the way that I communicate, which is very fast. Um, but I am very kinesthetic and Chris, actually my buddy I was telling you about who's auditory is auditory kinesthetic. And so when you're, uh, a fun example for us is we were recently learning how to ride a motorcycle actually and it, it was funny because it was so obvious which we were because chris got on the motorcycle and was like all right tell me what i need to do um and he is sitting on the motorcycle holding on to it kinesthetically and he asked tell me right just talk to me i want to hear it what i need to do when i it was my turn i was like okay you get on the motorcycle and show me what to do, then I will get on, do it for myself after I've seen what I need to do because I'm visual kinesthetic. So you can mix and match um, and, and you can be multiple of those. So, so if you feel like, oh, I'm kind of both, completely normal, um, but typically you have a primary one um, that you can start to um, start to understand. Um, and when you can start to communicate in this way, it's such an insane difference in the understanding people have. Uh, Laura, who's our support system, the glue of our team, um, is very auditory. The rest of our team is pretty much visual. And there are multiple times where she's like, guys, I told you about this last week in our meeting. I told all of you guys. And we're sitting here like, well, we didn't see it. We, what, what do you mean? What, what, what? And she's like, I told you. And we're like, we didn't see it. I told you. And it's auditory versus, versus visual. And I'm like, time out, time out. I feel like we've got an auditory message coming at full visual people, visual people frustrated and an auditory message. So let's cut this, have a conversation and cut that barrier. And so then once we mailed that, she very quickly pulled up, pulled it up and we we're like, oh my God, yes, I remember seeing that. And it was that fast, almost a giant explosion, but that quick, once our brains were firing in the correct way, boom, it was that much easier. You want your people on these Zoom conversations to feel that same way because there's already a weird barrier. So understanding these things is massive before we get into some of the deeper kind of building these tips. Um, and so that's this. This is the neuroscience portion. This is very much understanding the brain. Now we're going to shift into the mind a little bit more. Um, is there any questions or things from Chris or Brendan that you guys wanted to hit on so, first? So let's do our quiz here and see how many because I, I got a suspicion that we've got a kinesthetic in our group just uh -oh. based on my conversation with them. So is this is this resonating with anyone in our group? You like how I did that, right, Cody? <laughs> yeah, that was actionable intelligence. Good work. <laughs> there we go. I I tend to I'm a quick study. Okay, I'm thinking we got one. Okay, yeah, we do. We do. Okay, cool. All right. Run with it, Cody. Perfect. So then let's dive into uh, some some of the actual tips. So building the story. First thing we're going to jump into is TA, uh, which is shorthand for transactional analysis. Um, we'll move into upfront contracts, which is directing the mind, um, both minds towards specific things. Oops, sorry. And then the uh, CAPS and 101055 are some very specific tips for these Zoom conversations. Um, as you're starting to have more of these sales conversations, networking conversations, different things like that just to give structure. So the first thing we'll talk about quickly, um, and this is framed um, in, a sales, in, a, in a sales light, um, just because it's easy, it's easy examples. But when we're thinking transactional analysis, the basis of it is that we all have different ego states that are conditioned into us as we're children. So when I had mentioned that we are all uh, children just wearing adult costumes, that's kind of what I meant. And so you have these different scripts or different things and rules that you start to learn and you start you you have its parent adult and child those are the three different ego states and when you begin right you're a child you only have a child that's all it is and that child is melt is molded by the parents that are around them um, and so when the way you grew up the, the environment you grew up in your household uh, parents, mom, dad, all those types of things have an effect on the way that you meld that child script. What starts to happen through development is you start to finally develop that adult right there in the middle. So PAC, right? Parent, adult, child. You start to meld that adult, which is the justification. The, the adult portion of transactional analysis is, is 
over and over, your parents are like, don't cross the street without looking, don't cross the street without looking, don't cross the street without looking, till eventually they don't have to say that anymore. And your parent, or I mean, sorry, your adult ego state has that down. And that's a rule um, that you have to go through before you execute on any type of decision. Same thing with um, people that have a struggle a lot with these types of things, like you're, you're um, don't talk to strangers, don't talk about money, different things like that. Your adult has seared into when you were a child, your adult is starting to learn these things and you apply those scripts. And so understanding this, you really start to understand that when you're looking at these three ego states, you can you can kind of put them into three categories. So the child, they're the emotional one, right? So think of in a grocery store, the child wants to buy. They're like, oh, candy, I want it, I want it, I want it, let's do it. Yes, I'm excited, I'm excited. I can't have it, I'm pissed, I'm pissed, I'm pissed, I cry. That's a child, um, they're emotional, they want to buy. Uh, the adult has to justify. So for an actual kid, the parent is the one that ha is doing the justification. But now me as a, as a 24 year old, right? I'm not a child anymore. And my adult now, when I'm in the store, I'm looking at the piece of candy that's as I'm walking through the aisle and I'm like, oh my God, my child comes up and I'm like, I want it, I want it, I want it. And then within me myself, my adult says, wait a second, you're on a diet. You only have sugar on Saturdays. Today is Wednesday. We can't do this. Don't do that. No justification. Like, abort, abort, abort. We're not doing it. <laughs> um, and then the parent is the one who gives permission, right? Your parents are like, yep, you can cross the street now. Yep, you can talk to that person, right? They give you permission. They always have. Um, and so understanding that the parent gives permission, the adult justifies, and the child is the one that's emotional about it. You can really, when you start to understand that is a piece of the mind, you can start to understand that people want to be in that child state, right? And people, they, it's right under there. It, I've done this. In, <laughs> my favorite one is um, the, you know, the child's there because, and I've done this in front of a group of like freaking 500 people. It was hilarious. But like when you say something like, uh, uh, it, oh, this is why people, when you say poopy or different things like that, there's almost always a chuckle uh, because there is that kid that's underneath you. It's like, oh my God, it's kind of funny um, because we all have it. And, and so there we go. <laughs> we got one. Um, and so understanding that child is very important as you're framing up these conversations. And so to frame them, we use something called an upfront contract. So we, we got to understand the kid and understand that piece of a mind. And then understanding also that our minds are crazy and your brain has a very hard time aiming at a target that's not there. And so how do you help the person that's on the Zoom conversation that's already maybe a little frazzled with the conversation that's about to go down? How do you help them understand, okay, let's normalize this. Let's have a direction that we're gonna go in. And so we call, this something we call specifically an upfront contract, which is kind of a buzzword. So I just, I changed to face-to-face -face call steps. Um, but we call this an upfront contract because it's the beginning of a conversation right when you jump on and you start to build the story or you start to build the meeting and you direct it in a specific way just so that we can both agree that, yes, this is the direction we're heading and both of our brains, two brains are better than one. So if we're both heading the same way, the odds that you make it by the end, much, much higher. So it starts pretty simply. Thanks in time. Um, hey, thanks so much, Brandon, for jumping on. I had about 30 minutes on the books. Is that still okay with you? I know people are putting meetings back to back. If it's a hard stop, let me know. Boom, right? Appreciate them being there. Yes, for the time. The worst thing ever is when you run in and you stoke those stressful feelings because they have a meeting that's back to back because Zoom meetings you can put back to back. There's no travel time. And so if I've got an, another meeting I'm jumping onto right at 1130 and I got to pop off here, and you want to continue to talk because we didn't agree that we're going to stop right at 1130. Now you've got a stressed out person across from you. And when they're stressed out, the brain's not getting the right actions and they are not listening. Um, they're just thinking about how pissed the person's going to be that they're late for. Not fine. Um, uh, and then the next thing. So thanks to time agenda, grab theirs. Hey, I know I set this meeting. I hate shoving meeting down or agendas down people's throat without asking what's going on. Help me understand, like, what's one thing or, or by the end of this that you want to make sure that we hit on for sure? Like, the number one thing that we need to accomplish, what we've got to talk about, however you want to frame that up, grab their agenda first, get theirs first, then shift into yours. Um, whether you're a manager, uh, uh, owner, president, CEO, salesperson, doesn't matter, your purpose, what is it? Help define that. 
That's an awesome agenda. Thanks so much, Chris. I'm excited to jump into that. To get there, can we have a conversation about this, 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 and this? Sure, let's do that. Great. We both agree to that. And then defining kind of where we're going by the end of this, um, which is the upfront contract. So define your outcomes. This is the number one most missed thing that I've ever seen ever in my entire life. Granted, not that much time on earth yet, but still. Um, the, the outcomes, where are we going? Um, is this a networking conversation? Or is, if you're interested by the end, is, is there a next step that we need to be making? Um, defining yes and no, defining clear steps, like, oh yeah, and if we have a good conversation, we'll, we'll establish some next steps, right? That's wimpy. <laughs> have a deeper conversation. If this is something you're interested in, the next step typically for us is a discovery type conversation. It's about 90 minutes where we'll dive deeper into things specific to you. Would that be okay? Sure. And asking, is that okay, is massive. Um, if not, let's do a virtual knuckle touch. If it doesn't make sense, we'll vir virtual knuckle touch, still be friends, um, and see if there's anyone in each other's networks that we should be talking to. Is that cool? Sure. Now I've just defined yes and no. So we're directed at two things, not three things. Um, your brain automatically cuts out, right? It's a diet. A, there's two choices. That's always better for a brain. When you're thinking of, you want to go to Chipotle, McDonald's, or Wendy's, uh, you automatically, all of you, probably already cut out one of them and you're debating between two of them. If you let them do that debate in front of you with three things, they're gonna be thinking about all three of the, those two things throughout the whole thing. If you direct them with two options to begin with, now they are going back and forth between those throughout the conversation. And you'll get to one of those two as opposed to, well, I need to think it over because this third option and the fourth, and uh, right, it's not fun. And the biggest fear by the end, hey, my biggest fear is, we get to the end of this, we're all fired up about this, um, but we don't find any real next steps. You go into voicemail, I'm in voicemail jail, never hear from me again, and it's a pain in the butt that we have to chase each other. Do I need to worry about that? How can we address that? Anything that you're worried about, scared about, nervous about, oh man, my Wi-Fi has been crappy today. My biggest fear is that we lose our connection and we don't get to have the conversation we want to. If that happens, can we make sure that we can jump back in or just jump back into the thing? Whatever that is. My biggest fear, I'm not very good at the Zoom stuff yet. Um, and I need to share my screen and I might get that confused. If that happens, can we pause? Those types of things can really, really help um, building that upfront contract out. And so piecing these two things together is where it gets really, really fun. And so the upfront contract and this process helps you build a story. The, when, you're, when you're thinking of the transactional analysis, you can bring in that child. So children, what do they love to do? We all have one in us. They love to play. They love to pretend. They love to be an uh, astronaut and like, jump off the couch and they're flying, right? They're imaginative. That is still within each of us. And so for these Zoom conversations, one of the most effective things that I have been doing, um, especially in like a networking type environment, I've been doing these 30 minute virtual networking type conversations with people. And when I start the conversation in the, my upfront contract, in the purpose of the meeting, I literally start, well, I start the whole conversation. You're probably a little bit, you're probably wondering kind of what the reason or the purpose of, of this conversation is. And so by starting your upfront contract by saying, well, let's pretend we're networking. Like, can we just take a moment, put on our hats and we're kids again. We're just pretending that we are walking into a networking event and we're walking around, walking around and oh, we bumped into each other and now we're having a conversation. And so it's and just being able to pretend, would that be okay with you? Perfect. And now you've set the stage, you've built the story and you've got their brain, their, chi their kid working. And um, once you've got the kid working, now you can start to say, perfect. Okay. So we're walking that networking event. So when I'm walking into an event, typically I'm kind of thinking of two different things, right? So I'm thinking who in here can I help? And I, I need to help them or who is someone that I know um, or they, they can help me. Right? Those are kind of the two things I'm thinking about. Does that make sense? And they're like, oh yeah, it makes complete sense. Perfect. So by the end of this conversation, if we understand that I can help you or you can help me, can we, can we talk about that and figure out if we need to set a deeper meeting um, either way? And now I've what? I've set the outcomes and, and we're directed now towards something. And so they're like, oh yeah, that's perfect. Let's do that. I was like, awesome. And so the next, the next two bullet points here, 10, 10, 5, 5 or CAPS, are two different processes. I'm gonna go into both briefly. Um, but as you start to have these conversations, being able to frame the time that you have is massive. And so my agenda, if you remember back here, 
salesperson's purpose, the agenda. When you start to have these conversations, you're like, perfect. To get to that point, would it be okay with you if we spend about 10 minutes dissecting your story? I'd love to hear what you do, who you help, where you've been, what are your superpowers, um, and how I can, how you are most, how I can be the most assistance to you. 10 minutes on that, 10 minutes, happy to share my story. We'll go back and forth. You can ask me questions, anything that you'd like to know, happy to share that in the next 10 minutes. Then we'll have five minutes on, okay, we kind of know both of what we do. How do we work together? What do we do? Do we need to strategize? Do we need to, how could yours fit into mine? How, those types of questions. And in the last five minutes, we're up against the wall here. Would it be okay with you if we kind of figure out, here's some next steps. Here's some people I need to connect you with. Here's a conversation we need to set. Here's a, some time for us to jump into our calendars and put something on the books. And that's that last five minutes. And I'm establishing my agenda um, with theirs in mind. So it's 10, 10, five, five. And that's, that's a framework for a 30 minute conversation. If it's an hour, you can change up the timing, but give them the process to work within. Our brains love being within a checklist or within a, a process. So it may be a little bit weird that they're on Zoom and it's virtual. However, if you can structure this and give them a little bit more of that security in that structure, their brain will be so happy. They're like, yeah, no, this is great. I, I, had, I have no clue what I'm doing on these things. I'm happy that you're leading me. And it puts you in that trusted advisor role so that you're kind of leading the charge. Uh, the CAPS process is another fun one. This is more very specifically for networking where it's um, a conversation that you're trying to dissect them and what they're doing. Um, and so CAPS actually stands for uh, characteristics, alternatives, payoffs, and symptoms. Uh, should have had many bullet points for that. I'm sorry, I will go through it again. Characteristics, alternatives, payoffs, and symptoms. Um, and so what you do is when you're framing this, it, it, this is more of a mental image for you, but it's to dissect what they do and be able to create a 30 second commercial in a couple seconds for their business. One of the best ways that you can get into someone's brain is be able to take their information, chew on it, turn on it, repeat it back to them in an effective, efficient way. And so a CAPS conversation typically goes, the characteristics, help me understand your ideal. Who are you trying to get in front of? Who do you like to talk to? What size are they? What industry are they? Um, what, um, how, how many people are in their business? All of the, the nuts and bolts. Um, are they in America? Is it international? Is it national? Is it just within Missouri, just within Kansas? Help me understand. Build the picture. Let me see it. Then you move into the A. Um, which is alternatives. Okay, what are some people that say they do what you do um, or they have a similar value prop or, and people are like, oh, like competitors typically. And it's like, yeah, competitors are just people, people, things that your ideal client may have already tried to solve the problem that you solve. And they start to build out some alternatives. We metaphorically, our brains are really, really quick at making comparisons. When I can say something is like something else, that helps my brain. Oh yeah, that, that's a framework, I got that. So like a Pangelo is a great example. Most people have no clue what a Pangelo is. Um, and most of the time, someone else's business sounds like a Pangelo to you. So when you can build out that alternatives, you're helping your brain be able to make sense of the, the alternative section is like saying, well, Pangelo is kind of like an oversized grapefruit. Boom, right? That clicked in everybody's head. Oh, oversized grapefruit, got it. It's probably tart, it's probably this color, it's, right? It's a citrusy fruit. Um, and that's exactly what a Pangelo is. So building the alternatives helps you do that. Oh, you're kind of like so-and-so, or you're kind of like this. Um, helps you understand them better and helps them know that you do understand them. Um, and then payoffs and symptoms are the P and the S. So payoffs are what are the gains? Are, is it, do they spend less time doing a certain thing? Do they spend more time? Is it more efficient? Figure out your specific, their specific payoffs and the symptoms. Help them build the story. What, what are the symptoms? Well, if someone's sitting in front of you, you're the doctor of your business and, and you've got a patient, an ideal patient in front of you, what are, the, what are the symptoms? Well, they're pissed about this or they hate that or they've tried this before, they're inefficient with this thing or whatever the payoff or the symptom is. And then you've got the framework. You've got the characteristics, the alternatives, the payoffs and the symptoms. So you can quickly go, oh, okay, so you help people with these characteristics who might have tried these things, but it didn't work. They're experiencing these pains or symptoms 
And some of the payoffs or benefits of working with you are these in a 30 second commercial and people will sit there with their jaw on the ground like, what just happened? Yeah, that's exactly me. Um, and you have efficiently over a Zoom conversation bonded with them and gotten a deeper understanding of that, um, of them as a human being. And you've done it with them in a childlike state. So you're playing a game and it's fun for them to kind of talk about themselves. And it's a lot different, even over a Zoom conversation. It's just about putting them in that mental frame to begin the conversation. Is there any questions on this piece? None yet. And we are, this is some amazing stuff that Cody's sharing and he is going into great detail so that you can understand exactly how it will work with your own Zoom meetings. What that's doing though, is we are running a little bit short on time. And I don't want to ask Cody to skim through any of the points that we have coming up. So I just want to let everyone know this call or this Zoom meeting is being recorded. Go to webinar, podcast with pictures, whatever we want to call it, is being recorded. We will share the recording link with you later after the session is over with. Um, so I just want to make sure that everybody knows we are going to run over on time. So if you have a hard stop and you have to jump off right at 1130, we completely understand. I don't want him to rush through any of this next content, though, because there's still some amazing stuff that he's going to go over. So I just want to let everybody know that. And back to you, Cody. Thank you. And I, I saw that uh, symptoms, you want to go over symptoms again? Um, so symptoms are the pains is another way to kind of phrase that um, in a different way. Uh, some of the pains your their ideal prospect or their ideal client might be feeling. Um, so for us, right, uh, leaders, we, we love working with leaders in their businesses. Someone that is, if they were talking to Chris and they say, my people are driving me absolutely crazy. That is a symptom that people typically have um, that is a great conversation for me to talk with them. Because if your people are driving you crazy, this is a fun conversation, you are probably driving them just as crazy. Um, and so having that conversation is fun. Another symptom, um, we, we're closing, but our margins are crappy. We're not getting the profit that we want. Or a manager that's like, I'm having a hard time connecting what my leadership team wants me to do as far as the vision of the business and connecting it to my people and, and what motivates them? I'm, I'm just, there's a gap, I'm missing something. Those would be some other symptoms um, that they would have. I also refer to them as trigger events. That may be another way to frame yeah. it, where if mm -hmm. there is a stage in their life or their business or something happening, for instance, right now, if we have anyone in our call that works with organizations that deal with furloughs or layoffs or, um, you know, the, the rifts, whatever it is that they're being called, that is a trigger event that's happening in an organization that's having constraints or challenges. So that's another way that you may also reframe it. So mm -hmm. maybe pain could be trigger event, could be something that's happening. There's a defined moment in time. And the more right. you can describe what that defined moment is, the better you're gonna get introduced to the right person at that moment when they need you. Exactly. Perfect. I love it. Times are changing, my friends. Blue's my favorite color, too. So uh, the last piece that we'll kind of jump into is changing some beliefs about virtual meetings. Um, the, the interesting part is that this stuff is one of the hardest challenges or head trash is that, oh, it's all going to go back to normal. And they're kind of waiting, 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 waiting. Um, and the rest of the world is kind of moving on <laughs> because these it's even when we go back to in person, and I know Brendan and I have talked about this specifically, these 30 minute intro meetings that I'm having, there's no better way to have them than, virtu than virtually. I, I can meet with six people as opposed to three because I have travel time. Um, and so the efficiency, the buildings that are left open right now, like some of these things are, are hard beliefs to wrap our heads around and um, stunting could potentially, and I've seen, um, with some of our own clients, some of these things starting to um, get in the way of moving forward and moving past some of this stuff. It's that perpetual waiting game that won't ever end. <laughs> and starting to realize and change some beliefs around that is not easy, but it's possible. 
So understanding why that happens, I've noticed is, is a really awesome way to help people wrap their head around it, literally. Um, so your brain is actually biased to protect you. So you're not alone when you feel that way because your brain neurologically is, is stuck in, not stuck, but puts itself into patterns that are advantageous to your survival. You've got to remember that we have these brains that have been around for hundreds of years. And so as, as we're developing, they want to take us closer to protection and pleasure of staying alive. Um, and so think when change comes about, your brain is very biased to say, nope, don't do that. This is working. I am, we, have, we are surviving. We are living. Do not do that. Stop. Nope. Not going to let you do it. Um, and it'll fight you. Your neurology will fight you um, to protect you. Um, so don't, don't, don't be too upset about it um, because it can, it, it's there to scare you, to keep you within the alive section of, of this thing we call life, right? <laughs> Which is awesome. Uh, and so as you're starting to look at changing these beliefs, it for sure can be hard, but it is for sure possible because at the end of the day, your brain is a machine for change. That is what it does. It adapts quickly um, to the things in your environment and the different routines that you have. And so there's this literally a change bias in your head that makes it feel like change will be really, 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 really hard. Learning how to do Zoom, too hard for me to, to attack. It'll take too long. I can't do it. I don't have the time. All of those things, those words that start coming in your head, those beliefs. But in reality, your brain, once you start to make the changes, like riding a bike, it's hard at first. You may fall on your butt a couple of times. Um, but the more and more that you do it, the quicker and quicker and quicker that you start to, the latency in your mind, you're thinking it's going to take me months to figure this out. But in reality, if you took a, two weeks on average, and this is proven neuroscience, two weeks on average to learn any new skill, to get the pattern in your brain to where you don't feel nervous, anxious, worried, scared about the new thing that you're doing and to get into that pattern. Um, and the COVID patterns, we've all probably felt them working at home and then shifting back to going back into the office, right? You're shifting patterns there. And so you could even feel that. Like there are times where you feel a little bit nervous. You're like, oh, I, I'm not used to this commute anymore. Do I, do I, or the gym, I went to the actual gym yesterday for the first time in months and I forgot to scan my ticket going into the parking garage. Just a, a thing, a routine that I used to be in I'd walk in, scan my card, do my ticket, and I'd walk to the locker room. But now there's all this stuff that you have to do and wash your hands, get your temperature checked and all this kind of stuff. And so I just completely forgot. There was a new pattern in my head. I completely forgot to scan my ticket. Got down to the thing, didn't have my ticket scanned. I was like, crap, my brain, come on, man. But you can change these things. And so when we look at this, changing your outlook, this is kind of the, the way that your brain shifts through these things. Um, and we're not gonna have a ton of the time to go through kind of the actual actions you can take here uh, today. But um, when you're looking at this belief wheel, this is typically how you kind of shift through these things. Um, so you, if you're starting at the top, you've got beliefs, judgments, actions, results. So your beliefs form the judgments you make about certain things. Um, if using a dog is an easy one, and I saw an amazing friend's dog this morning, got me going, I loved it. Uh, but if you, as a child, you form the belief, you see a dog chasing someone else, now you've got in your head the belief, oh God, dogs are scary, they attack people, that's not fun, right? Then when you see another dog, the judgment you make is, oh, all dogs are scary, try and kill people, and I, I'm scared of them. So the action you take is, get away from the dog, I don't want to talk to them. And the results you get is, you're afraid to be around dogs, you get anxious, you get worried, panic attacks, whatever. Starting with the belief. So how do you shift that? There's a couple different ways. Um, and kind of where you attack within this kind of wheel is a great spot um, for us to, to, to start shifting some of these. So what people, a quick one, most people will be probably pretty familiar with is the beliefs, I am statements, changing that internal narrative um, and that head trash. Just the quickest tip on that one is name that negative voice, name it, right? The, the negative, scared, worried, anxious, all of those feelings, name that whatever that voice is, give it a name. It's gestalt psychology. You're playing around. It's fun. Mine is Jerry. Whenever I start to get negative, I'm like, Jerry, this is, no, bro, get out of here. I'm not, I don't have time for you. I'm not, get out of my head. <laughs> and you name it. And when you can name it and take it out on someone, you literally are doing that in your brain and you can kill those beliefs quickly. So that's a quick one for beliefs. 
we're not the, the most effective is action and um, the how to do that is we have a framework um, called BAT which we don't have time to jump into today um, sadly but luckily um, we Brendan and, and I and Chris and my team here at Sam are kind of pairing up together to do a um, uh, pivot to profit where we're kind of talking about this behavioral change and it's great if you're scared of dogs, but if you're scared to pick up the phone for a cold call or walk into a networking meeting, like what is the action steps that you can take, like boom, 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 to, and we're diving deep, very deep into those, that very specifically in that conversation. So I won't go into it there, but just having an awareness that this is the process that you can take. Um, and if you start getting new results and you start changing those beliefs, the judgments you make about certain behaviors start to change and the actions you're able to take, you can move those out of your way. Um, and so we'll jump into that behavioral change model in that conversation. Um, but just having an awareness that this is kind of how you change your outlook is where we're kind of stop for the, on this today um, and kind of move into any discussion that, that you guys may have on some of these things. Oh my goodness, where do we start? Okay, let's really quickly see what questions we have based on what you've covered so far, because there is so much. Mm. So well, let's do a quick. Let's we've just do a quick. The questions already. So. Okay. Cool. Well, let me do this. Let me just take a quick summary check of based on the information that Cody shared with you. What behavior are you going to change based on how you approach virtual meetings moving forward? That's what I'm most excited to hear from our group. Because this is. You know, the thing about whenever you go to any kind of a training session, what happens is you end up getting a few good ideas. And if you don't stop and think about how you're going to take concrete action and move forward with it, it's what we call entertainment, which may be fun, but it's not a productive use of your time and it doesn't get you long term results. So let's hear what one thing you're going to take out of today that you're going to apply. I had a few people still on the call, so let's hear. My group's typing. <laughs> so is the fun part. <laughs> I know. I know. Okay, cool. My favorite that I'm taking out of it is the caps. That mm. is the coolest thing. So, and the 10, well, can I do, I want to do two. <laughs> and the 10, 10, five, five. That's, that's another one that I'm going to take out. That was super cool. Chris, what about you? What are you going to do? I love doing these. That's, that's, that's funny because I, I, I've been through Sandler and I, I love this information and it, the funny thing is, is that I, I learned it in a sales format, but what I want people to do is think about it in a marketing format. And mm. it, oh, it cool. changed how I uh, wrote copy for ads and things like that is, is right. Uh, there's a very basic principle is everybody's walking around the world thinking about one person. It's not you. And so if you address pain common pain that you solve in an ad, it's more compelling than going, hey, I'm wonderful. So I love all of this content. And for those of you on the call, um, we're, we're gonna have a special offer here in a couple of slides that uh, we're really excited about. And we're giving um, a discount to the WBC and- you know, Oh, that's right. Cody, Cody's gonna Cody, go over- Cody's going to go over it. Well, first of all, let's go back one more slide. Let's let's yeah, sure, my bad. because they're you know they're supporting us and doing this, and we're very. We very want to give a shout out. Yeah, have, the women's have, best You can go to this page here on on even bright event bright, excuse me, and you can see a ton of their um, content that they have going on. And like uh, Brendan said, they have a video library starting to build and things like that. And um, we're just very, very grateful for them for supporting us here. And then the next slide is um, something that we want to, you know, this is the first offer that we're we're building. Brandon and I are building a, this brand new program, and it's um, it's outstanding. We're in beta right now, and so if you're interested in it, it's I don't know how, you, how would you say it, Brandon? To me, it's 
building a knowledge product and, and the, the short of it is, hey, do you want to make money while you sleep? <laughs> right. I love that that whole idea. And if you go to this link here, you're going to get this slideshow. You're going to get a link to the video so you can go over this information um, at your own leisure. Um, I'd, I'd suggest clicking this link and get it on the waiting list because it's going to be uh, phenomenal. It's it's Brendan's got clients that this information has changed their um, income right from from one level to the next. It's, it's phenomenal. And then the next slide is this is what I wanted to get to is. This is the, our offer to the sequel, your wallet strikes back. It's pivot to profit. So if you love this information like I do and, and you want to hear Cody go into more detail, um, please. This is when is this? This is on. I didn't put the date on here. It's Thursday. Next Thursday, right? It's the 24th. Yep. Is that right? No. Yep. 23rd. It's the 23rd. Right. And so and you can go. Um, if you, if I will send you this deck and see where it says click here. That's the link to the landing page to sign up for it. And if you enter the code WBC50, you're going to save 50% on the registration. It's just for you guys, just for the WBC members. And believe me, for Sandler, I paid <laughs> a, oh, lot yeah. <laughs> more, a lot more than this. And it's it's mind-blowing. It is mind-blowing the, the, the facets of your life that this touches. I mean, Cody, even going over you know, auditory and visual and kinesthetic that, that changes relationships, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it can change sure. how you're, how you speak to your spouse. It can stop arguments. So, um, and let alone with yeah. sales and, and marketing and there's, there's so many facets that touches. So I'd like to invite all of you to, um, go to this link, sign up for it. You will not be sorry. And we're going to record that as well. So we'll, we'll make that available to you, to the people who pay or the, the people sign up for the it. participants. Yep. Awesome. Okay. And then here's all of our information so that you can reach out and connect with us. By all means, reach out, connect with us on LinkedIn. We should probably put on some LinkedIn badges so that you can click the links for that. Oh, that's good. We'd love to welcome you to our network and um, keep us posted. Also, let us know what you'd like to learn more about. We've got some fun topics coming up. Next week, we are going to be diving into the e-commerce side of it. Our big emphasis when we started collaborating with the Women's Business Center, so many companies are struggling right now because they've had bricks and mortar or they have only had one, at, one path to revenue. And our goal with the Business Unusual series has been to help you expand those paths to revenue and get to a lot more opportunities than you're currently finding so we want to make sure that we continue to serve you in that way we're going to do kind of a two-part series so chris is going to do the first part which is setting up an e-commerce page on your website and then the second part to that series is going to be creation of knowledge products so you are going to want to for sure jump in on those over the next coming weeks. So I want to just wrap things up with a huge thank you. And thanks to Cody for taking so much time and going into great depth of here's how we can be a lot more effective with our own virtual meetings. Chris, thanks for running everything and keeping us moving and um, of course making our conversation as productive as possible. I want to apologize. We did go over about 10 minutes. I think the information we covered was well worth it and um, I look forward to continuing to engage with all of you and build relationships in your business. And I want you to remember one key thing as you go about your business today. In order to get what you want, you have got to help others get what they want have a great day and i want to wish you good selling bye everybody thank you see you guys